Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. Welcome to One to One. While almost 70% of the students in New York City's public high schools are black and Latino, they comprise a mere 10% of those who attend the eight elite high schools that admit students based on their rankings on an admissions test. How can the city spread the educational benefits of its elite high schools to a more racially diverse group of students? And what about the city's gifted and talented programs in the elementary and middle schools, whose students are also predominantly white and Asians? These are questions David Bloomfield, professor of education, leadership, law, and policy at Brooklyn College and the CUNY Graduate Center, has grappled with, and he'll share his thoughts with us today. Welcome. Thank you. Last year, Mayor de Blasio and Schools Chancellor Richard Saranza announced a plan to increase racial diversity in the city's elite public high schools. But after receiving a lot of pushback to his plan, last month he said he was backing away from it. What did you think of the mayor's plan, and how do you feel about his decision not to go forward with it? The mayor's plan on the SHSAT, the single rank ordered test that uh, admits students to these schools uh, was actually a good plan. Uh, he just didn't put any political muscle behind the plan. Uh, so I supported that, but it really is time for the state legislature to repeal the state law that requires that test and leave admissions to New York City public schools to the New York City Department of Education and its citizens. Now, I think there was a proposal to repeal that law but then the leadership said, we're not, I'm, we're not gonna vote on it. Is that what happened? What happened was there was a, a bill to change the law. Nobody could agree on what the changes should be, and, and so that bill went nowhere, which was totally predictable. The best solution is to simply repeal the law, a yes or no vote, and then return that kind of admissions decisions to the city of New York. Now, the test, I mean, currently, there are actually nine specialized high schools. One is LaGuardia, and you get in by audition. The eight others currently use the admissions test, but only three of them, Stuyvesant, Bronx Science, and Brooklyn Tech, are required by law to use the test, correct? That's correct. Uh, in 1970, the hecht Calandra bill, which was intended to make these schools kind of a fortress of white privilege, uh, demanded only that three schools, the ones you mentioned, would use the SHSAT. Mayor Bloomberg, in his wisdom, uh, increased that number to, to another eight. five schools. Right. And I say we should free the Bloomberg Five from that kind of regimen. It doesn't make sense educationally. It also has a, a terrible effect on racial uh, dis diversity, but it makes no sense to be choosing students for these schools based on a single rank ordered test with no look back at what their grades were, what their other accomplishments may have been, their writing ability. In fact, these supposedly science-centric schools, there's no science on the test. Really? That's interesting. Does New York City need to have high schools where exceptionally bright and talented students are taught separately from regular high school students? Do we, do we need schools like that? Educationally, we don't need those. In fact, uh, to turn your introduction on its head, I think we need to diversify the education, the educational benefits from the other schools to the specialized high schools. Uh, it's ridiculous to have so people who are regarded as well-educated to go to a school which is predominantly white and Asian when the majority of the city's population is black and Latino. So we need to spread the wealth in both directions. But the answer to your question is also a political question, more, I think, than an educational question. And politically, apparently, we need to be able to sort kids by calling them gifted or non-gifted. Uh, but Educators, by and large, don't see a specialized high school for these students as necessary. Okay. Um, why is it important? I mean, it may seem like a, a rhetorical question, but why is it important that there be more black and Latinos in the elite schools? If you're going to have elite schools, 
Why is it important that you have more blacks and Latinos in them than you have now? Right. These are high schools. In high school, kids should be having a comprehensive curriculum of English, math, science, social studies, and the arts. Uh, they should be exchanging points of view with one another. And if you have these students living in a bubble, and many of these students have been in an academic bubble since elementary school, th to be well-rounded adults, they need to have a well-rounded education, and that means with a diverse student body. And that diversity extends not only to race, it is uh, going to school with special needs students, it is with uh, students who speak other languages, uh, and those kids are almost wholly excluded from the specialized high schools because it's this one single state-mandated test. Is the test the only thing that's keeping more black and Latino students from getting into those schools? I think what happens is that we create a kind of vicious cycle because so many black and Latino kids don't attend because of the test. Other black and Latinos say, why should I take the test in the first place and put all that time into tutoring when I could be doing other things, when I would be going with just a handful of, of kids like me? And, and so there's a, a hostile environment, I think, whether intended or unintended, so that black and Latino kids don't even put it on their uh, radar screen for application. The mantra has been that the students get in to Stuyvesant, Bronxide, Brooklyn Tech, primarily because they, uh, they have the money to pay for preparatory courses. Um, and that you, you hear that a lot. But Asian students who, for instance, are 70% of Stuyvesant, um, Asian students, the, the average family incomes in New York City are lower than those of blacks in New York City. Do we, do we know that, that those students are actually paying for test prep, or are they get, just getting in because they study harder? Well, one of the questions would be, what are they studying? Are they studying their school subjects? Or since there's only uh, math and uh, English language arts sections to the test, are they studying for the test? I would say that that's a misappropriation of time. Uh, but it's also a question of where you put your limited financial resources. And in the Asian community, there is an industry, and people like to call it a cottage industry. It is not a cottage industry. It's an industry of test prep. And this is more about tutoring than it is about talent. Okay. There have been a number of programs, I know, uh, over the years that have been aimed at increasing the number of blacks and Latinos in the specialized high schools. I think free test prep courses. Uh, I know there was something called discovery program. I don't know if that was for the specialist high school or something else, but there have been efforts. Uh, so why haven't they been successful in creating more diversity in those schools? There are a number of reasons why it hasn't been successful, in including the discovery program. And we're about to see what happens with the expansion of discovery under the de Blasio discovery plan. Program? Discovery really is just a way of substituting to some degree students who fell just below the cutoff for these schools for kids who were slightly above the cutoff. But it's still test-based. And I want to emphasize that the test as a exercise in academic talent makes almost no sense. We might as well give the kids a hard crossword puzzle that they could study strategies for, for doing well and, and give it to them. Uh, so. In the African-American and Latino communities, the idea of test prep hasn't caught on. Uh, there's an arms race, so kids are starting in the paid test prep programs at sixth grade, and these test prep programs uh, that the DOE offers, uh, and, and offers to all students, not just to black and Latino students, uh, are a few weeks just before they take the test. Uh, it, it just isn't enough, and we're still talking about tutoring. We're not talking about proven academic talent through grades and other inputs. So if you don't use an admissions test um, as the criterion for whether you get in or not, 
what, what do you do? What should you do? People often talk about the Texas plan for University of Texas at Austin admissions, which is the top percent of students in grades from every middle school. And that's what that's the mayor one, was talking about, and right? That's, right, that's one possibility. Uh, you could have uh, multiple measures. You could use uh, both test scores, state test scores, and grades. Another way is you could have a tranche of students who only get in through the SHSAT, say a third. Another tranche who get in through a multiple measure situation and another tranche that get in through grades. Uh, in Chicago, they use uh, a income test because they want to make sure that poor kids get in as well as wealthier kids. And, and so there are many ways to skin this cat. It's not a science. Nobody knows who should get in and who shouldn't get into these schools. And uh, we need to move that away from this legislative fiat. It's simplistic and wholly political in terms of the single test and have studies and some consensus build up if we're going to have these schools at all. So have the Texas plan and the Chicago plan, have they been successful in diversifying? This They've been very successful at diversifying without apparent watering down of standards, which is the shibboleth that opponents often use. Uh, it, it, these are self-fulfilling prophecies. You admit kids to a school that you label as a specialized elite high school, and then all of a sudden the kids are walking around with labels that they're specialized and elite. Uh, I, I think that kids are much more complicated than that kind of binary that they're in a specialized high school or not. In fact, a lot of white kids are going to these uh, kind of new breed of, of screened high schools very often, like Beacon School, where one of my kids went, and, and they wouldn't be caught dead in the pressure cooker of a Stuyvesant or a Brooklyn Tech. Okay. We have to take a short break, then we'll be back with David Bloomfield, Professor of Education, Leadership, Law, and Policy at Brooklyn College and the CUNY Graduate Center. Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy and I'm talking with David Bloomfield, Professor of Education, Leadership, Law and Policy at Brooklyn College and the CUNY Graduate Center. I just wanna follow up uh, on what we were talking about. If you were the czar of uh, public school education in New York City, would you get rid of elite specialized high schools altogether or would you just change the system for deciding who goes to those schools? Well, first of all, we shouldn't have a czar. Uh, it, it needs to be a community process. And again, the problem is that the state in 1970 decided that this is the way it's going to be, and we have to get away from that. Uh, I, multiple measures is my preference. Uh, kids are holistic in their interests, in their ability, and they shouldn't have to prove their intelligence in one way uh, rather than some other way. Uh, and especially a situation with a standardized test that is highly tutorable seems like the worst way to go. But you do see some value in having schools for I don't know, the best and the brightest or whatever. I, I, I suppose I would rather have an integrated school uh, where all sorts of kids are going. And if you happen to have advanced classes in mathematics or science or English for that matter, uh, then you can offer those classes within the context of a larger situation. Okay, got you. Beyond the specialized high schools, there's the city's gifted and talented program for elementary and middle school students. And as I understand it, that consists of five so-called gifted schools and about 75 other gifted and talented programs scattered around the system. Usually you have one gifted and talented class per school that has such a program. 75% uh, of the students uh, in those programs are white and Asians, which means that those programs are somewhat more racially diverse than the specialized high schools, but not a lot more. Um, 
And these students, the gifted and talented students, are selected on the basis of a test given to them when they are four years old. I assume parents have to request that their students be, take, be tested for gifted and talented? Yes, that's correct. Okay, okay. Now, a panel appointed by the mayor um, has recommended sweeping changes in that program. What kinds of changes and what do you think of its proposals. The School Diversity Advisory Group, the SDAG, came up with two reports and in its second report, its final report, it recommended elimination of this uh, kindergarten-based gifted and talented program uh, where students take a test, again a single standardized test, uh, no interviews, no nothing, which other gifted and talented programs in the city, for instance the Hunter College Elementary School, pursue, the independent schools pursue. This is just one test where students often get tutored, tutored again, and uh, they, that should be eliminated. I think there's widespread agreement it should be eliminated, and it took this SDAG to recommend that formally to the mayor. The mayor, unfortunately, seems to have shelved that for now, and he only has another two years in the administration. Uh, that would be a great benefit to the students of New York, <laughs> these, these little supposedly gifted kids, as well as everybody else, to uh, stop that kind of premature labeling of, of intelligence. Okay. Um, if there's little racial diversity in the specialized high schools, and there's little diversity in the gifted and talented program, there's also very little racial diversity in the public schools overall. New York uh, is said to have the most racially segregated schools in the country. Um, is that true? And how segregated are they? It, it is true. Uh, the uh, statistic that's all usually mentioned is one that comes out of UCLA, and that had to do with the whole state. But the elephant in the room in that study was New the York New York City, City Department of Education. Uh, our schools are highly segregated, and I think it's the mayor's single greatest failure, uh, perhaps in his whole administration, certainly in education, that he hasn't attacked this on a citywide basis. He's allowed certain localities to go forward, community school district 15, 3, and 1, uh, three is the Upper West Side of Manhattan, one is the Lower East Side in Chinatown, and 15 is Brownstone, Brooklyn. Uh, but, but those have been community-based, and uh, we can only go just so far in terms of community-based desegregation programs. Why are New York City schools more segregated than, say, the schools in Alabama, where I'm from? Why? Well, of course, we do have a great range of, of uh, residential segregation, but the schools themselves are even more segregated than the neighborhoods. Uh, so uh, there's a high degree of, of racist-based sorting that goes on, uh, particularly in, in the white community. They think a better school is where most of the white kids go. And then you start looking at test scores and you say, oh, well, that's a good school because the test scores are high. Uh, we really need to look at attendance zones to make sure that attendance zones cross neighborhood lines and encourage as, as much uh, mixing of the races and mixing of, of academic abilities as, as we can. And that's a citywide mission, not one for the community school boards alone. From my observations, my personal observations, white parents, for the most part, do not want their children to attend a school with a large number of black and Latino students, maybe a handful, okay, <laughs> but not much more than that. And given that blacks and Latinos comprise almost 70% of the public school population, um, is school integration in New York City possible? School integration is, is possible. Uh, it would be beneficial to, to all. Uh, we have to stop concentrating, uh, especially poor black and Latino students, uh, many of whom have other situations like home instability in the same schools. Uh, we do a terrible job in an American schooling of concentrating poverty in certain schools and affluence in other schools, uh, 
we then look at the test scores and we go, well, the kids in the affluent school are going to a good school. I, if you have school choice, I'll send my kid to that school. And, and we perpetuate this problem when uh, if there was political will uh, on the part of the leaders to take on some of the racism in the rest of the community, we could have more integrated schooling, and that means better schooling. And, and the answer to that is, is it drawing up the school districts differently? One of the recommendations of the SDAG that hasn't gotten enough attention is they said we should change these community school districts that were established in the late 60s uh, in an effort at community control we, and, and on an ethnic and racial basis very often, whether it's East Harlem, which is District 4, District 5 is Central Harlem. Uh, they've, out, they've outlived their utility and we don't have community control, so we should break up those artificial borders that very often keep kids from going to school together. It's sort of like gerrymandering of yes. public schools. I think you said that you feel that the de Blasio administration has not taken sufficient steps to bring about greater desegregation of the public schools. What would you like to see him do? Or the city do? It's interesting that in the preliminary report of the School Diversity Advisory Group, they recommended that there be a desegregation or diversity uh, point person at the Department of Education. Uh, that's among the dozens of recommendations, uh, that was one of the few that de Blasio didn't accept. And we really need a point person to assemble a, a professional staff, go out into the communities, listen to the communities about what they want in their schools, and to develop a, to develop a plan that crosses district lines, that changes school zones, that changes admissions policies in these screen schools, and have a multi-dimensional multi plan for desegregating the New York City public schools. It's ridiculous. Uh, after Brown in 1954 and after the Civil War in the 1860s, we still have the most, or at least one of the most, segregated systems in the country. Um, a lot of times you hear that, um, you know, the black students, Latino students uh, in, in public schools, the schools that they, are t they attend are labeled as um, not good schools, and particularly as having not the best teachers. Um, and I wonder, I mean, is, is that true? Is there any evidence that the teachers in predominantly black and Latino schools are less good teachers than teachers in white and Asian schools? Um, and I, I wonder about that. I want to say a couple of things about that. The, first of all, going back to our conversation about the specialized high schools, I, those teachers are just New York City public school teachers. Uh, we don't have selective placement of teachers in the specialized high schools. Uh, we have selective placement of, of kids. And, and so teachers of all sorts are at all schools. And, and it's ridiculous to mark some schools and some teachers as failing because of low test scores among their children. Uh, so but what is true in, in uh, schools with low-income students, we have newer teachers. Teachers tend to leave those schools. The working conditions aren't as good as they are in the predominantly white schools. And, and so an experienced teacher is better than a first-year teacher. As a former teacher, I can tell you that for sure. Uh, I think it's child abuse to send a new teacher into uh, a, uh, a classroom with kids with no support, sink or swim. It's bad for the kids, it's bad for the teacher. Uh, and half of our teachers leave within five years. And those are the teachers who are populating our low income schools. And do the school, do schools where predominantly black and Latino students attend, are they any less funded? You know, at least at the state and city level because you hear that. But is that true? It, it depends on the school. Uh, we have Title I coming in from the federal government, and, and those go to generally high poverty schools. 
Uh, but then we have wealthier schools where parents associations can raise hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, and that gives them a leg up. And, and, and so the financial arrangement is quite checkered among the schools of New York City. We certainly need a lot more money coming in from the state to make our schools as good as they can, and as good as they are, well-resourced uh, in the suburbs. Well, the, the, the issues are fairly clear, but the solutions are somewhat more complicated. And I was telling you when I was preparing for this, boy, my head was spinning. But thank you <laughs> for making um, some of this a lot more clear to thank you. me and my viewers. We're out of time. I'd like to thank Professor Bloomfield for joining me today. For One to One and the City University of New York, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.